Hey everyone, I'm ready to talk again about the seven mountain and the seven mountains and the controversies related to it. You know, last year the Lord spoke to me and said, "Johnny, this message, get ready. It's going to go from being just the forerunner message to the runner message. A forerunner message is when most are not on it, most aren't getting it. When it's a runner message, it means everyone's on it. And so we we uh, we really have seen the the shift here in 2019." as it relates to the seven mountain message in so many ways and its advancement and, and fast forwarding. And so, and, and part of uh, what comes with that is more attention, more criticism. We have those who primary call the body of Christ, uh, at least they feel like it is, is to be the critics. And they feel like that's their ministry and it's fine. It allows us to ask some hard questions at times. And so we've addressed, um, I've done two videos on it already, two short videos. One is the seven mountain message dominionist and number two was is the seven mountain message elitist and the short answer on both of those is no and no but you can hear the uh, uh not just the explanation but the full thinking behind that as you get to those so what i want to talk about uh this time is uh, another question it, it that i've been asked does that the seven or you know say an accusation about the seven mountain message that it uh, diminishes the church. And so the question is, does it diminish the church? And um, I, we can give the quick answer, no. And, and then we'll, we'll explain. Again, the, as we expand into it, you'll see that the seven mountain message actually completes the church and finally gives it the proper, uh, the proper positioning that is, that is required. Part of what we share is that you know, studies have shown that if a pastor is looking at his congregation, only 3% of his congregation will ever have a traditional, typical ministry assignment. That means only a maximum of 3% of the members of his church will either be in the future pastor, uh, youth pastor, worship pastor, missionary, evangelist, whatever, uh, whatever that we look at and consider a normal ministry. And so if you do the math on that, that means 97% will not. And it explains the huge orphan spirit that's in the body of Christ because we have 97% in general feeling like they're second-class citizens within the kingdom. And, and this, is, this is clear. And so, you know, the, the, the self-talk they have is if I was important in the kingdom, God would have given me a pulpit. He would have given me some kind of ministry position. Our message, the Seven Mountain message says 100% are ministers. 100% are needed. 100% carry the image of God, 100% have glory, presence, solutions to receive and showcase in every area of society. And again, if, if by validating 100% for ministry, uh, if that is now something used to say is, is reducing the value of traditional ministry, well, in some way it is, but it doesn't diminish by any means the church or pastors and some pastors have been concerned. It's like, yeah, the, you know, people don't feel like they need me anymore because they have their own mission. They have their own ministry. Uh, again, because we're so out of balance in this area, in the, in the process of correcting, there are going to be some pastors, and particularly pastors who aren't, aren't that mature, who are not that apostolic and seeing the big picture. And unfortunately, a high percentage of pastors are not able to see the big picture. And so when you don't see the big picture, you don't understand the heart of God to see 100% activated, 100% validated. And in doing so, when, when you're no longer getting, you know, get to be considered the tiny elite that is ministry, you can, uh, for, for the lack of attention that you're getting, that you used to get, you can see it as somehow diminishing you. But if you understand it in the kingdom context, you clearly understand that this is not something that diminishes the church. It is something that completes, expands the church. Uh, we have e even, you know, the understanding of Jesus' words when he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That the word he chose to use for I will build my church was a word ecclesia, a word that had never been used before in a religious context. Uh, the way we would think of it, he, uh, you know, we think I will build my church. We think of a church building and a church time when you meet. That's what they used to apply to temples and synagogues. Jesus could have said, I will build my temple and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He could have said, I will build my synagogue and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He said neither. He used an entirely new word. It was, 
you have to guess it was almost offensive to, uh, uh, if we want to call them the believers of the day, those who followed God in that day, because it was, it was a term, uh, you know, the, uh, this was something the Greeks were familiar with, ecclesia. The ecclesia, the, word, the, the first part of the ek, it means come out. So it was the called out ones, those who come out from their homes into a public place of deliberating over civic matters. And you can see the, the heart behind it is, uh, it connects to his whole theme in his first message. You are the salt, you are the light. So where does salt and where does light work? Even in his message there in, in uh, Matthew 5, verse 16, 17, uh, about, a, about a light, a light cannot be hid uh, you know, it can't be hid under a bushel, but it must be in a visible place so all can see, the whole house can see. So let your light shine before men. And so that before men is, is contextualizing where he wants us to show up. And before men is decidedly outside the four walls of the church. We can say it includes that, but the emphasis is decidedly outside of we are to be ones involved in the situations, the circumstances, the challenges, the joys of our community, and we are to participate in, in the processes there, deliberating, bringing the kingdom, bringing solutions, bringing answers. And so I will build my ecclesia, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell position themselves. They are, they are established on the tops of each, of each mountain. You have corruption and darkness in the mountain of government and in the mountain of media, in the mountain of arts and entertainment, the mountain of economy, the enemy establishes a gate of hell at the tops of every mountain. And so he understands that, you know, he understands what he's heard. He can read the Bible. He's heard Jesus say, I will build my called out ones who will function in a civic capacity. They will function as a council. They will bring presence. They will be those who are salt and light in every practical area of society. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against them. They will come and they will be able to do damage to the gates of hell that are there. So it's an important uh, understanding for us. It's not whether, you know, it's, uh, this goes way beyond does this, does a seven mountain message, does a seven mountain mandate diminish the church? We must have it in order for the church actually to be what it's supposed to. We, we turn into the salt that is good for nothing but to be trampled upon and cast out. The very, you know, his first warning to us, this is what you'll become if you do not get out of the salt shaker. Where's the salt shaker? That's going to be the church in the building in the way we think of it now. And so to function there is, it's, it doesn't matter how beautiful your salt shaker is and, and how crystal white clear the pieces of salt in. If they only remain in the salt shaker, then it is good for nothing but to be trampled upon and cast out. So we have to understand that this, this message of the seven mountains, the seven mountain mandate, the reformation mandate, the transformation mandate uh, has to validate several things. It has to validate 100% of the sons and daughters of the king as having an important assignment. And it has to validate assignments that go beyond Sundays, that go beyond weekends, special events, special nights into the nine to five window. The kingdom of God was not just designed to show up in our free time. The kingdom of God was designed to show up in our intentional time, the nine to five world. And it's not just about getting people saved. It's about bringing God's solutions, his presence into the marketplace, into systems so that the systems properly represent the king of kings on earth. And it's something we'll grow into, uh, particularly since we're just now beginning to embrace that assignment. So I just want to challenge every pastor there to, uh, you know, grow with the message. And, and to the degree you are able to celebrate and champion this message within your church and, and, and not have an insecurity complex about not being viewed as, as uh, you know, as godlike in your status as you were before, then the better you will do. The, the word, the message to the rest of us is, yes, don't, don't allow the seven mountain message, the seven mountain mandate to lessen the view of the church in your mind. There really is, uh, there's great importance in us coming together, even if it's on Sundays, coming together, worshiping together, uh, being encouraged together. And I think, you know, the goal of our Lord is that the, this kingdom uh, message would come out, would be stirred up during, during Sundays, if we say Sundays is our main meeting day, that there would be instruction, equipping, and then releasing 
uh, deploying of the sons and daughters of the king Monday through Friday in every area of society. So it's, it's not to be diminished at all from our mindset, our standpoint. We're to look at it really as the central volcano. We come together. This is where it all happens together. There's great value in corporate worship and, and, and what, what can take place when we come together as the body of Christ. And out of this, as we are posi uh, properly positioned and then directed and, and targeted into the mountains, into uh, the, the structures of society itself, we can leave as living stones, lava stones, fire rocks, and Monday through Friday, Monday through Sunday, Monday through Saturday, depending on your weekdays, you carry the kingdom of God. You carry his presence. You carry solutions. You carry intentionality. That's the main thing. You don't view yourself anymore as a secular person. We have all this light. He said, you are the light of the world, but we have all this light with the light turned off because inside we said we're secular. The light is the 3%. No, light is all of us. And we all have uh, the rights, the responsibilities and privileges of taking that into every area of society and yet validating the role of the church that meets in the building, the church that has apostles, prophets, apostles, you know, the fivefold ministry and the members join together. That's all valuable and of importance. And so we want to uh, acknowledge that perhaps some who run with the seven mountain message say, hey, normal church is not important. It's not about throwing away one in order to go to the other. By properly emphasizing the ecclesia, the church outside the marketplace, we, we do not do that by throwing away what we had before. It's both, it's both and, um, just similarly to where there was an accusation that the Seven Mountain message might be elitist, that we're only targeting the tops of the mountains. No, no, no. We want to target both, but we've already been doing all our targeting, all our funding, everything is for the bottom of the mountains. Now let's do the top as well. We're saying the same thing. It's not for there to be uh, less valuing of what we consider traditionally the church, but that we also value the church in every area of society. So it's a process. The Lord's taken us there. And so I hope that helps uh, clarify some things, and uh, I'll look forward to interactions from you on that.